So I I got to have one praise today. I thank God for the Lord. Don't think about it. I mean, it's been a long time since. But uh, thank God for that. So now I'm down with business. Second Corinthians is <coughs> scripture reading from God's word today. It's Second Corinthians five. 13 through 17. <clears throat> if it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. <clears throat> and if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. We died for everyone so that those who received his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How different we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has come to a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. So be it. Stand up or raise hand, whichever you want to do. <laughs> Al's trying to get up, but he's slow. Thank you, Al. <laughs> you know, we take for granted what freedom means. And especially during this virus, you've seen that. Because people, I, I, I have a right to do this. I have a right to do that. Each and every day, we should get up and thank God that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to set the captives free, to relieve our blindness so that we could see God's love, and so that we can see that we are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this world. The story that Polly read and then the song that's patterned after that, do people see your compassion, your love, your kindness, or do they see your hypocrisy? You serve one of two masters, plain and simple. That's what Jesus said. And you're either gathering people for the kingdom 
or you're scattering people because of what you say and do. So I entitled this message, if you had a title, Kim, but you don't, From Sin to Salvation, because that's what we've read in Romans so far this week. From a fate that was indescribably horrific to a fate which is indescribably terrific. Wow! All because of God's love and faithfulness to spoiled, rotten, unfaithful children. Isn't that a good way to put it? And we have no excuses, as we read in Romans chapter 2, for being God's children and then pointing fingers at the world and saying, you guys do this because us guys do this. We have no excuse whatsoever. And we've got to remind ourselves daily that we are to be like Christ in this world. We have freedom to give up our selfishness, our pride, our insecurities, our fear, and instead trust Jesus, thank God, and live a life of thinking of others first instead of thinking of ourselves. And like I said, just look in this world, and if we acted that way, how much different than would we really look? So I'm going to start back in Romans chapter 2, verse 17. I know we read that the week before last. But I want to read this, and I want you to think of where Paul's writing to the Jews, God's children, how the same thing would apply reading it to the church, God's children, you and I, Christians. So starting in verse 17, You who call yourselves Jews, you who call yourselves Christians, or call yourselves the church, are relying on God's laws, and you boast about your special relationship with Him. You know what He wants. You know what is right, because you have been taught His law. You are convinced that you are a guide for the blind and a light for people who are lost in the darkness. Now I'm going to stop right here and add into this. First of all, a lot of Christians don't even realize they're supposed to be the light. Not necessarily do they hide it, but not necessarily do they set it out for the world to see. But the world is watching. If the world knows that you call yourself a Christian, they are watching. And most of them are watching with skeptical eyes to watch you fall, to watch you be a hypocrite, because they're looking for a reason not to believe. Because of some pain or suffering or whatever it is in their world that has said, why would God allow this? Because, see, they're still in darkness. They haven't seen the light. They want a God that meets their needs. We're right back to when Jesus Christ came. And on Sunday, they were saying, Hallelujah, here comes the King of Kings, Hosanna. And on Friday, they were nailing Him to a cross. Because it wasn't the Messiah, the Savior, that they wanted to see. They wanted to be set free from persecution, physical persecution. They surely didn't want to give up their life so that they could put others' needs above themselves. Back to verse 20. You think you can instruct the ignorant and teach children the ways of God, for you are certain that God laws, God's law gives you complete knowledge and truth. Well then, if you teach others... So the first thing is, are you teaching others? Second thing is, why don't you teach yourself? You tell others not to steal, but do you steal? You say it is wrong to commit adultery, but do you commit adultery? You condemn idolatry, but do you use items stolen from pagan temples? You are so proud of knowing the law, but you, but you dishonor God by breaking it. No wonder the Scripture says the Gentiles blaspheme the name of God because of you. The Jewish ceremony of circumcision, and now let me put in the Christian ceremony of baptism, has value only if you obey God's law. But if you don't obey God's law, you are no better off than an uncircumcised Gentile. And if the Gentiles obey God's law, won't God declare them to be His own people? In fact, uncircumcised Gentiles who keep God's laws will condemn you Jews who are circumcised and possess God's, law, God's laws but do not obey them. For you are a true Jew, or you are a true Christian, not because of, of you were born of Jewish parents, or not because you had Christian parents or went to church, or because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision or baptism. No, a true Jew, a true Christian, is one whose heart is right with God. 
And true circumcision is not, uh, not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart that pro produced by God's Spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not people. Are you seeking praise from God by not only reading and studying and praying and meeting together, but how you are like Jesus in the world? As Polly asked, would you stop and consider someone else's needs? Or would you say, my needs are so urgent and whatever, I don't want to be inconvenienced. This is going to happen to me. My wife's going to be mad. I'm going to be late. Who knows when I'm going to catch my flight? Or would you stop and have compassion? We read through Matthew already. How many times did you see Jesus' compassion poured out on the people? If it wasn't for Jesus' compassion, He would have never laid down His life to save you and I. If He didn't humble Himself and deny Himself first and leave heaven, He would have never taken up His cross and died for us. And we're supposed to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow after Him. Are you a new creation in Christ Jesus? And if you are, are you living like that new creation? So then we get into Romans chapter 3 and we see this problem of sin in our life. That all sin, and what a gloomy fate we all have if it were not for God's love that sent Jesus Christ to die for us. And is it not God's love for doing that that it should compel us to be His hands and feet in this world? Reading on in Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 20. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. You've heard me say it several times. You can go through and try to mark off each one of the Ten Commandments, just the ten. And if you don't fail miserably, go do it again. Sit down first, examine yourself, and go do it again because you will fail at doing it. I don't care who you are or how righteous you are. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. Verse 21, But now God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who they are. Romans 3.23, the first verse in the Romans Road. These verses that show us the way of salvation. For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Verse 24, yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of, for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His life, shedding His blood. Is that what you believe? If you creep reading in Romans chapter 3, verse 31, Well then, if we emphasize faith, does this mean that we can forget about the law? Of course not. In fact, only when we have faith do we truly fulfill the law. Then it goes in talking about Abraham in Romans chapter 4. If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God he would have had something to boast about. But that was not God's way. Verse 3, For the Scripture tells us Abraham believed and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. Down in verse 9, Well, we have been saying that Abraham was counted as righteous by God because of his faith. But how did this happen? Was he counted righteous only after he was circumcised? Or was it before he was circumcised? Clearly God accepted Abraham before he was circumcised. Now if you've been listening to the videos this week, I made a point of this. I went back and went over the history of the world, basically. In Genesis chapter 11 we have the Tower of Babel. In chapter 12, we have Abram's call. In chapter 13, we have Abram and Lot. 14, we have Abram rescues Lot, and Melchizedek blesses Abram. In 15, we have God's promise to make a covenant with Abram and protect and bless him. 
His descendants would be as countless as the stars in the sky. Verse, or chapter 16, Abram takes things into his own hands though. God hasn't answered his prayers in his timing, in his way. And Abram has a child with his handmaid. And we could go all the way down that trail and see where all that has led to even in the world today. You don't take things into your own hand. God answers prayer in His time, in His way. And you need to put your faith and trust in God. But yet that scripture told us that Abram's faith before all this happened was what made him righteous. And I told you this week that Abram only had a mustard seed of faith at that time, did he not? And that's all that Jesus tells us to have. And then Jesus tells us to increase our faith. And if you remember the story there, the man says, Please increase my faith so that I may believe. What's so cool is that God not only saves us from our sin by sending Jesus to die for us, but He helps increase that mustard seed faith all along the way if we simply allow Him to do it. So that we can have faith of what we think of when we hear of Abraham. Because we think of him being willing to sacrifice his son. But see, that happens many chapters later. I want to read from Hebrews first and see what the author of Hebrews said. In Hebrews eleven seventeen, 17, it was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promise, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. Now if you go back to Genesis 22, that's where you're going to find the story about Abraham and Isaac. That's many chapters after God's calling. Many chapters after God counted him as righteous. Many chapters after the covenant agreement where God changed Abram's name to Abraham. And here's what we read in Genesis chapter 22, starting in verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Now, I want you to pay attention to some of these next things, and of course I'll highlight them for you. The next morning, there was no delay. Without delay, hesita hesitation, or questioning, Abraham got up. He took his, got up early. He saddled his donkey and took his two servants with him. So even taking witnesses to what he's going to have to do. So the world is watching him. <clears throat> Along with his son Isaac. Couldn't he have taken a substitute maybe? Wouldn't have God been pleased with someone else? But God told him clearly to take your only son, the one you love, Isaac. Then he chopped wood, so he had to labor to do this job. He had to chop the wood for it. He chopped wood for a fire, for a burnt offering, and set out for the place God had told him. <clears throat> On the third day, a long trip where he had to go this whole time knowing that he was going to have to kill his son. There still seems to be no hesitation, no questioning. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw a place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told his servant. And here's my favorite part of it. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We, the boy and I, will worship there. And then we, the boy and I, will return. Wow! Now, if that's not faith, I, don't, I cannot imagine as a father what Abraham is thinking, except this, God is almighty, sovereign, holy. He deserves my complete and utter obedience. To love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, soul, body, strength. And Abraham never wavered from what I can tell here. And when he came back, the servants saw. They saw Abraham's faith in what he did. Now I doubt very seriously you and I are ever going to be tested that much. 
But we might be. I have no idea. I don't have any idea what the testings and the things that you're faith, facing in your life now. But I know that God is faithful. I know that God loves you and I. I know that He loves us beyond anything I can fathom because not only did He save Abraham's son, He killed His son to save you and I. Wow. God loves us. Are you living? Does Christ's compel, love compel you to be a light to this world? As we read on through Romans chapter 4, we see that even when there was no hope, there was hope. In verse Romans chapter 4, verse 18, it says, Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping. A few verses later in, in, chapter, in verse 20, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God. All the different trials and tribulations that you're facing will only make your faith stronger if you believe. As most of you know, Sherry and I almost got divorced years ago. It's a testimony that we say now, and many of you can probably say that. But who would have ever thought at that time with all the trouble that we were going through that then we could use that to witness to a bunch of youth group kids, right, Joy? And tell them what we had been through so that they would understand that. Sherry had some problems that her mom pushed on her, and I shouldn't be saying things without her here, <laughs> with drugs and alcohol. But then she was able to use that and talk to the youth kids where I couldn't relate there because she had went through that. God had brought her through it. And looking back, I think I can say this for her and I can say it for, for me as well, if it wouldn't have been for our faith in God, which was mustard size at the time, I don't know if we would have made it through that trial and that persecution in life. But by God's grace, we have. And it has made our faith grow stronger. So now I know whenever she's not here, I can say this. Whenever she takes up a frying pan and knocks me in the head, I can say, she's not going to kill me. <laughs> she might whack me, but I'm not going to die until God's ready for me to die. It's making my faith stronger. Now, don't tell her I said that. <laughs> Verse 25 of, of chapter 4 says, He was handed over to die because of our sins, meaning Jesus, and He was raised to life to make us right with God. So in Romans, we have went over sin. Now we're introduced to salvation. Salvation through Jesus Christ, for He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. As we read on, in Romans chapter 5, you learn that faith should bring joy. Indescribable joy that you cannot keep quiet. Because you have this joy, you should tell the world because they are blind. They are dying. They are hurting. And you know what? They are looking, whether you realize it or not. Because like I said earlier, something in their life has made them numb. The pain's there, whatever it is. And they're looking to you, O oh Christian, to see if your faith is real or not. Go back to Abraham again. His servants may have knew what was going on, may not knew what was going at all, but they watched him. They watched to see if Abraham would be a bad master. They watched to see if Abraham would truly worship this God that he says he worships, even in trials and persecutions. And then his actions showed them that Abraham's God was real. And not only was Abraham's God real, but Abraham's God was loving and kind beyond anything we could ever expect. And remember, again, Abraham's God was not a God that would have said, go kill your son. Did something happen? Did God change? No, because God will never, ever change. And you can have faith in that. That nothing will separate you from God's love if you've been established through Christ Jesus, your Savior and your Lord. So then we get to Romans chapter 7, and there's a strange example. Did you struggle with that one, Merle? Where it starts off with a marriage and all this, and I talked about it a little bit in the video. But basically, 
Paul's talking about, and we don't understand it today because the marriage covenant is not as strong, literally. We get divorced because of irreconcilable differences. What is an irreconcilable difference? Can we not all agree? <laughs> Can we not come together? Does your covenant agreement with your spouse not mean anything? Oh, and it's a covenant agreement with God. So Romans 7 says there's this woman who is married to the law. It can't be a man that's married to the law because you wouldn't have the same. This is a story that, that you should understand. The woman was bound to her husband, almost like property, what, right or wrong. She was bound to her husband. Whatever he said, he was her master, she did. She was obligated. Good or bad, doesn't matter, she was obligated. But once he died, she was not obligated anymore. She could go on and find another love, another husband. So Paul compares that to the Jews and the law. Law is a great thing. It tells me how to behave. Without it, could you imagine if there were no laws in this country? It would be utter chaos. And there are penalties associated with the law. The greater the, the crime, the greater the punishment. So put that in your thought process again and think about the fact that you sin against the most supreme being in the world that's beyond what you can fathom. So the penalty of your sins is, should be a pretty hefty crime. Eternal death and separation from God Almighty. But He loves you. He sent His Son to die for you. That you could be with Him instead, even though you've done those horrific crimes. So, I should want to do the law. That makes sense. But I can't do the law. It only shows me how bad my situation is. But with Christ, I can be married in this new relationship. The law is still here. The law is still good. I know that I should obey it. But instead of a focusing on, I shall not steal, kill, lie, whatever. And you know what kill means. If I've had hatred in my heart, then I can focus on my relationship over here. And if I love the Lord my God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, guess what? This ain't going to be a problem as much anymore, is it? I'm not married to this, but since I am married to this, to Christ Jesus, and I fix my eyes on Him and the love of God and everything else, then these things are going to become foreign to me to the point I never have lustful thoughts anymore. I don't hold that anger in my heart. Are there still days when it's going to be there? And I'll bring it back to a personal relationship with my wife. Am I still going to have days where she makes me mad as can be? Yes. But also because I love her so much, I'm going to say, thank you, Lord, for the wife that you've given me. Help me to quit being selfish and thinking about myself first, but to think about her needs and desires. Father, forgive me and help me be the husband that I am called to be regardless of what her position is so that I can love unconditionally, which is the wedding vows that I said in the first place. And I meant every word I said that day to her. So why am I acting like a two-year-old, as I said in, in my video? Because I didn't get my way. That's the example that Paul is giving us. In the end of the chapter, Paul says, as his own life, giving himself as an example again, what a wretched, pitiful person that I am. Because I continue to do the things that I don't want to do. Oh, how I need to fix my eyes on this relationship. And the chapter ends, and remember, there's not chapter breaks and stuff in the original writing. It's one continuous letter. So let me read you the end of Romans chapter 7. But guess what? I'm going to start, stop a few verses short and pick up next week. Starting in verse 14. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, or I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the only one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. 
And I know that nothing good lives in me that is, that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I, I am not really the one doing it. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life, that I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free, from, free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, if you go back to the original Greek, and if you look at most every translation that I looked at, the word used is Lord. If you're only thanking Jesus Christ for being your Savior, you don't have it figured out yet. You're still trying to be over here when you need to realize that you should be here. That God loved you so much that He sent His one and only Son to die for you. And if you believe and put your trust and faith in Him, how can He not be your Lord? How can you not be sold out to Him for what He did for you? For the terrible position that you were in because of sin. But instead, He robbed you from the grave. He purchased you back and gave you eternal life and adoption into the kingdom of heaven as God's beloved child. Wow! The answer is Jesus Christ our Lord. If Jesus isn't Lord of your life today, then today is the day. Today is, he is the day He's calling to you to think about where your relationship is with Him. Is He Lord of all in your life? And are you living, as the story said in the video showed, are you living a life that shows He is Lord so that others see it, especially your spouses, especially your children, your parents, whoever it is, in the entire world, that they may see Christ in you and that they may be drawn to Him rather than shunned away from Him. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for Jesus Christ our Lord. That he would give up heaven to die for our sins to save us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that you have given us that seals us where we can cry out, Abba, Father, to you. That we know without a doubt that we are your ch child, your children, Father. Lord, give us more and more and more of your Spirit as we die to the law, as we die to our sinful desires, as we focus and fix our eyes on Jesus and the relationship that we have with Him and with you, Lord, we thank you and praise you for the finished work of Christ Jesus on the cross. And as we're reminded this weekend, as we celebrate the freedom that we have, help us to remember that Jesus Christ set us free to be in a beautiful, loving relationship with you. And help us to live as we realize the love that we have for you. And that how can we not love our brothers and sisters that we see and touch and feel. Lord, we thank you that you chose to love even your enemies when Christ Jesus gave his life to save us. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.